Welcome to the Three Martini Lunch. Grab a stool next to Greg Corumbus of Radio America and Jim Garrity of National Review. Three Martinis coming up. Hey, really glad you're with us for the Tuesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. We actually have two good martinis for you today, as well as one that is very much not good, uh, which we'll talk about in detail at the end of the podcast today. Uh, Let's jump right in with the fact that, uh, hey, it's primary day, but we're talking about congressional maps. So while some states are actually having their primaries right now, uh, others still don't know what their map is for this year's primaries. And I guess you can get away with that if your primary is still a few months away. And that's the situation with New York State. You might remember the Democrats there with a very aggressively gerrymandered map, uh, hoping they could pick up three, maybe four, maybe more uh, House seats and leave the Republicans with only about two or three in a state the size of New York. Well, court after court has struck that down. And now, while it's not official yet, It appears that the quote unquote special master appointed to draw up the new maps uh, has come up with a version that's probably going to leave things at the status quo and maybe even give the Republicans a chance to pick up a seat. Uh, Politico says uh, the special master tasked by a Steuben County court with drawing new congressional lines for New York has released a set of draft plans. Carnegie Mellon fellow Jonathan Service, the special master, is expected to finalize his maps by Friday. His plans would lead to a radically different set of races than those that began to take shape after a different set of maps was enacted by Democrats earlier this year. So it's not only confusing for the voters, candidates don't even know what district they're going to be in at this point, Jim. So that's always fun. But the good news here is that the Republicans look like they're going to get uh, a much fairer shake than we thought a few months ago. You know, Greg, you almost never hear about redistricting fights in Vermont. (laughs) Or any other state, Montana, you know, any other state that just has one House seat. Uh, These things are going a little bit simpler. Now, look, it, it, this we have seen this very odd phenomenon of this year of which Democrats more or less panicked and screamed that Republican gerrymandering was going to secure them the House and democracy would be lost. And the Washington Post warned us that it died in darkness and, and all that stuff. And lo and behold, you know, most Republicans, I suspect in part because they were running an incumbent protection racket instead of trying to maximize their potential gains op, uh, strategy, ended up not maximizing their gains in a whole bunch of reddish states. And in the blue states where Democrats did control redistricting, they went um, as, fa- as far out as they could. I almost used a very off-color metaphor there to you know minimize the number of, of seats Republicans could win, squeeze them into as many districts as possible, or to kind of create you know good, safe 60-40 districts where, yeah, you could lose them, but you'd really need the, uh, the, 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 the board to break a certain way. Obviously, you know, at some point people are going to say, "Ah, no, this is kind of ridiculous, even by New York standards. And it's really interesting that the status quo is being treated by Democrats as this colossal defeat and this utterly unreasonable situation that they can't possibly win in and stuff like that. Um, Look, I, I think in general, the outlook for Republicans in the House is good, even without these sorts of redistricting fights. But this is probably puts... Anywhere, you know, conceivably up to 10 in play, although I think that's really the most optimistic scenario. I do think you get the minimum four stay Republican or are more likely to stay Republican. And uh, a you know, Democrats hopes of keeping the House, which are already very small. And the question was, OK, how much could they minimize the bleeding, so to speak? Uh, it's going to get much worse from this. So, look, it's a good development. I don't like seeing these, you know. I prefer the you know the house fights be less focused on gerrymandering, but when Democrats really push too hard on this one, they've gotten the backlash, and that's where we are. You know, Jim, you mentioned uh, a moment ago how there aren't any major redistricting fights in Vermont or Montana or states that don't have more than one congressional district. One of my favorite things that you can uh, see on social media, and you can just weed out people whose opinions you can ignore for the rest of your life, is when uh, the Senate won't pass something. And then Republicans get accused of gerrymandering Senate seats. Yes. That's that's yeah. my very favorite. <laughs> How did they end up lining up the state lines just the way they needed them to? <laughs> Darn founding fathers. Yes. They put those rivers in those places, too. It's <laughs> yes, just amazing. Republicans really are powerful that way. Anyway. And we say that. And, of course, some listen, you know, some some Democrat are like, wait a minute. But if we, re- if we put the rivers on a different course, we could redraw the state boundaries. <laughs> Speaking of which, lots of states with primaries today. Pennsylvania is getting most of the attention, but Idaho, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Oregon also having primaries today. So if you're in those states and you haven't already voted, get out there and vote. Make your voice heard. Uh, In the meantime, while you're waiting for those election results tonight, be comfortable. 
with all the fabulous products from My Pillow. And right now, as we've been talking about, they've got their BOGO extravaganza, buy one, get one, including on My Pillow bed sheets as low as $59.98, the Elegance My Pillows as low as $49.98, and the Roll and Go Anywhere My Pillows starting at $29.98. You want to BOGO, buy one, get one free for the Roll and Go. The Roll and Go Anywhere My Pillow. You can use it on your couch, your recliner, anywhere you want to be. It's versatile enough to take it with you on vacation or anywhere you're going. It's available in multiple colors and patterns. They're machine washable and dryable. And the Roll and Go Anywhere My Pillow has a 10-year warranty and 60-day bunny back guarantee. It is a buy one, get one free extravaganza at mypillow.com slash martini. Bed sheets and my pillows, yes, but they're just the tip of the iceberg. Find the full list of BOGO offers by visiting mypillow.com slash martini or call 800 874 0104. Stock up with buy one, get one free savings today and get Mike's book free with any purchase. Mypillow.com slash martini or call 800 874 0104. Mypillow.com slash martini all right jim on to uh good martini number two and we hope this one stays a good martini but uh since it involves vladimir putin's comments you just never know but putin who just a couple of days ago was talking about uh, increased military action if scandinavian nations sweden and finland join nato appears to be doing an about face while addressing a meeting of the collective security treaty organization this is from yahoo news for months, Russian officials have warned against the two countries taking this decisive step. But now that it's actually happened, Putin appears to be doing his best to diminish the significance of the act. Quote, as for the expansion of NATO, including through new members of the alliance, which are uh, Finland, Sweden, Russia has no problems with these states, Putin said Monday at this summit. He says expansion at the expense of these countries does not pose a direct threat to Russia. So, Jim... Uh, as I said a moment ago, you never know when he's going to flip back in the other direction. But it's kind of curious that uh, he's doing this. Uh, you know, the, one of the big things uh, that he argued as to why the Ukraine war was necessary was because uh, that NATO was uh, inching in that direction. Then he made a lot of noise about these Scandinavian countries. Not so much. Is that because he actually doesn't see them as a threat or because he knows he's really not in a position to do much about it? I, I'm thinking it's the latter, Greg. And there's a couple of uh kind of interesting factors pointing to this. Remember, you know, when this invasion first began, we were, you know, there were projections Kiev could fall in three days and, and this was going to be this rapid overtaking of, if not the entire country, then the eastern part of the country. And that has not really taken place. And in fact, it feels like week by week, month by month, we're seeing the Ukrainians push the Russians back closer to the uh, status quo borders. Uh, in fact, I think they reached the Russian border in one of those places along the front. Um, that is a good sign. And so Russia's talk of what they're going to do has not been followed up by uh, fulfillment of those goals for quite a while now. And so the, this is another case of, you know, uh, Finland and Sweden, a lot of tough talk, a lot of menacing talk, a lot of threatening talk. And then when push comes to shove, Russia appears to be either, you know, not necessarily backing down, but not making good on those threats. And the other thing which kind of caught my eye, uh, just floating around Twitter yesterday was a Russian state media, it's a television, it sounds like a roundtable discussion, and they had a, um, a military analyst, old guy who looked like he'd been in the military, and it really sounded like almost exactly the kind of message that if, if you wanted to see the conflict come to an end, you would. this is the kind of message you would be sending to the Russian people. And it basically was a pointing out that the resistance from the Ukrainians has been much, much tougher than expected. The fact that they now have NATO weapons makes them a much more formidable foe. The Ukrainian morale does not appear to be shattered. And in fact, their you know, Russian morale seems pretty tough. You can interested, there's a, the, some, one of the hosts or one of the guests was trying to push back against this and saying, oh, they're not professional and, you know, they aren't properly trained. They're not, you know, they're just conscripts. And the military experts are like, yes, but they're fighting for their homeland and they can put a million arms into a million men's hands. And that turns into a real threat for an invading Russian army, no matter what's going, you know, no matter how well trained these guys are. Um, and so you, and then at the end, he made a point about how Russia is effectively geopolitically isolated. We is basically us against the world, which is not a message you've been hearing from Russian state media very much. There was some pushback on this point saying, oh, China's on our side. And this Russian expert's like, yeah, well, technically yes, but they're not really doing much to help us. And so I kind of wondered, is this Russian state media preparing the Russian people 
for, and they, they wouldn't call it a defeat, but an end to the conflict that does not end on the grandiose terms that, that Putin had promised. Is this the, you know, kind of the truth slipping through or an attempt to kind of soften the blow for Russians when they realize that after, you know, three months or however, however many more months of a special military operation, the grand victory has not occurred. The drug addicted Nazis have not been driven from Kiev. And, you know, the base, oh, 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 by the way, Russian people, this turned out to be much harder than we expected. And we're not going to get the victory we thought we were going to get. God only knows if that really means anything. But it does seem significant that this viewpoint was expressed on Russian state media. And as far as of this recording, there's been no word of this guy, you know, disappearing into a van or something like that. <laughs> um, this doesn't, you know, in other words, there may be some interest in the ranks of Russian state media of acknowledging that the war is not going well, and maybe it's time to end it on terms that are less than ideal for Russia rather than continue it and have the circumstances get even worse for the Russian people, Russian economy, and Russian army. Yeah, I was going to say face down in their polonium, but yeah, it's <laughs> who knows. But yeah, the fact that that's happening on Russian state TV is uh, is significant, I think, very significant. All right, uh, let's move on to our final martini now. It's a bad, it's not a crazy, but man, it's really depressing. Uh, first of all, we've got record high gas prices again. Uh, the AAA gas meter uh, average cost, $4.52 a gallon, actually a little bit north of that. And it's even worse for diesel, which is where we're going to focus here. It was the focus of Jim's morning jolt today. Diesel is over five and a half dollars a gallon now. So a uh, whole different uh, scenario, 557 to be precise. But uh, Jim, we're hearing about potential shortages. We're hearing about potential rationing. Uh, as you point out in the jolt today, uh, some items just aren't worth it to be shipped anymore, which will lead to uh, empty shelves depending on the product. So how did we get here and how do we get out of it? Yeah. So just a, a before I begin, you know, I'm very lucky to be able to do what I do. Hopefully I like to think that I create some value for everyone who chooses to read or listen to this podcast. And very often it starts with a question in my mind of, okay, well, you know, why are diesel fuel prices so high? I understand, you know, supply and demand and all, but like, we we'll, this, this is the record highest it's ever been. And, and as Greg alluded to every couple of days, you go look on the, uh, the triple A site, it hits a new record. So, so what is going, we, we've had high gas prices in the past. Yes. Some of this is COVID-19 and yes, some of you know conceivably, but like, why, you know, why have we gone from uh, about, you know, price a little bit above $3 a gallon to five fifty dollars a gallon uh, when it comes to diesel fuel nationwide? Well, you know, a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, obviously the, uh, you know, state taxes don't help. You're paying, if you're buying a gallon of diesel fuel in California, you're paying somewhere around six fifty, dollars and about a dollar of that goes to the state government. Uh, the federal tax is $24, $0.24 cents a gallon. Uh, that's a little bit higher than regular gasoline at $0.18 cents a gallon. So yeah, so taxes don't help, and we're always going to do what we can to whack around taxes like a pinata on this podcast. But that's not the primary reason of why things have gone up. You know, Generally, a good chunk of it is both the cost of crude, which is going up for obvious reasons. But the second thing I think is really significant and hasn't gotten nearly as much, enough attention is the cost of refining oil. And oh, by the way, uh, diesel fuel costs the, the per, a higher percentage of the cost of a, di, a gallon of diesel fuel goes towards the refinement than towards uh, than does compared to regular gasoline. So what happened? Well, during the shortly, first of all, shortly before the pandemic, uh, over in Philadelphia, there was a very big refinery, Philadelphia Energy Solutions Refinery, had an explosion uh, in 2019, and they chose to shut it down. They didn't officially shut it down until 2020, and during that pandemic period, where obviously gasoline demand was much lower. Uh, a whole bunch of oil companies and people companies that ran refineries looked at it and said, well, which ones do we not need anymore? Which ones aren't efficient? Which ones aren't cost effective? And they ended up shutting down five more over the course of the year. Shell Refinery in Convent, Louisiana, Tesoro Marathon Refinery in Martinez, California, the Holly Frontier Refinery in Cheyenne, Wyoming, the Western Refining Refinery in Gallup, New Mexico, and the Dakota Prairie Refinery in Dickinson, New Mexico. Put them all together, that's more than a million barrels of oil per day of refinement capacity taken offline. Thus, we started 2021, the beginning of the Biden administration, with the lowest annual capacity of in six years. And no, we did not really expand anything in 2021, and there's no indication we've expanded so far this year, or nor are there any plans to expand any of these current refineries. Now, if you're like, oh, no, this is, you know, this is bad. Uh, why don't we just you know, turn them back on again? Well, actually, you can't. Uh, the Philadelphia refinery is being demolished. 
A uh, whole bunch of them either are already alternative fuels complex that are taking biofuels and switch grass and place things like grain, stuff like that, and turning it to fuel. Uh, or some of them are in the process of doing that. So no, there is no switch you can flip to do that. Oh, by the way, as you know, as bad as this all sounds, um, there's a, another company called Lydenol Basel Industries said in April that their Houston crude oil facility refinery, they're going to shut that by the end of 2023. That plant refines about 263,000 barrels of gasoline, diesel fuel, and jet fuel per day. Now, we, you know, on the Republican side of the aisle, you hear a lot of drill, baby, drill. And I'm all for that. But we should point out that it doesn't do a lot of good to drill, baby, drill if you are not simultaneously refining, baby, refinering. Um, and that is, you know, you, 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 that's where you end up with this giant backlog. Um, we almost never build oil refineries in the U.S. anymore. We have built one new one since 1977. We would have had an absolute uh, disaster on our hands if we had not been able to expand the existing refineries. A couple of them have done that in the last couple of years, but by and large, it's very uh, rare to see those things. People don't like oil refineries, and I understand why. I've driven, we all drive past the New Jersey Turnpike. We know they're not pretty. We know they're ugly. We know they smell bad. We know people don't like the emissions, but... The upside is if you live near a oil refinery, the gas is generally cheaper because it takes less time and money to bring the gas to your local gas station compared to ones. And I think there are only oil refineries in about 30 states. So in about 20 states across the country, it has to be brought in from somewhere else. Um, that is why diesel fuel is super high expensive. That is why shipping everything is much more expensive. The To get out of this problem, we would have needed to start building more refineries or expanding existing ones years ago. And we did not do that. And oh, by the way, it's very clear that the Biden administration does not has no desire to do that. And the oil company is like, look, it costs us a lot to do to either expand an oil refinery or to build a new one. We're just not going to do that because we know that, you know, even if we get it online and we takes a couple of years to do it, people are turning away from fossil fuels. We have an administration host hostile to fossil fuels, more people buying electric cars like Teslas and stuff like that. It just doesn't make sense for us. So that's why. You know, so in a very strange way, the oil companies that environmentalists hate are doing what environmentalists want. They're switching over to biofuels. And in the process, they've cut down. We no longer have enough refinery capacity. We do not have enough ability to make the fuel we need. And we're not going to have it for a good long time. Hey, happy Tuesday, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but to be fair, Jim, who could have figured out that not building more refineries for the past 40 <laughs> plus years or more nuclear plants would have been bad for domestic energy policy? We're all going to run on, on, on unicorns and, uh, you know, <laughs> Farting Skittles and stuff like that. Yes, it, it basically, that's our environmental policy. Is this entirely because of environmental policies? A better and smarter administration it would have looked at these refineries going offline, realizing six in a year, uh, soon to be seven, was a really bad sign. And that if you didn't have anything to replace that, you were going to have a, you're going to start feeling a squeeze. Uh, as far as I can tell, Jennifer Granholm has been just too busy laughing about, you know, when you ask, what are you going to do about gas prices and stuff like that? So, Nobody at the energy department seems to be paying attention to this. Nobody at the energy department seems to be worried about this. And that is why diesel fuel prices are high and they're probably going to remain high. Oh, by the way, diesel fuel is what they use for like 98% of all construction projects. And what did the Biden administration just pass legislation to do? Infrastructure projects. <laughs> hey, that high diesel fuel prices aren't going to complicate that. And you know, asphalt, we can make that without oil, right? Yeah. yeah. Great calls, guys. Way, way to go. Perfect storm. Never let a crisis uh, stop you from creating a bigger no, crisis. Never solve I a crisis, I believe, is the bottom <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh, Jim. Yeah, so a lot of primaries tonight. And, uh, you know, the thing that's already annoying me about the media, uh, because they're lazy in how they cover these primaries, it's, uh, it's all about Trump-endorsed candidates. If they win, look out for this radical. If they lose, ah, the Trump train has no more power in the party. Uh, and then it just fluctuates from race to race with no cohesion whatsoever. Yeah, there was, we had a good piece on, on the Nebraska governor's race, which was seen as a Trump defeat. And that's and basically the gist was, that, well, no, one candidate was running on local and state issues and the other one was running on I'm endorsed by Trump. So was it an anti-Trump vote? It's just mostly that one candidate was a better candidate focused on what the job actually is, as opposed to how do you feel about the former president? And I think that's kind of a useful point for a whole bunch of you know Republican candidates. You know, what you say about the issues does matter. Some people do pay attention to that. Uh, and we're not just entirely a cult of personality of pray yay or nay on the former president.
Yeah. Yeah. Be interesting to watch tonight. A lot of key races. So uh, including uh Senate race in Pennsylvania, Senate race in North Carolina, which is an open seat. So plenty going on and uh, a lot more primaries in the weeks to come. So Jim, rest up. See you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity, National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Uh, do subscribe to the Three Martini Lunch podcast if you don't already and tell your friends about us as well. Uh, we thank you for your five-star ratings and your kind reviews. Please keep those coming. Get us on your home devices. All you have to say is play Three Martini Lunch podcast. And follow us on Twitter. He's at Jim Garrity. I'm at Dateline underscore DC. Have a great Tuesday and please join us again on Wednesday for the next Three Martini Lunch. Democrats are angry. Hunter Biden's laptop is still under scrutiny. Yes, it is. And the left is hoping hoping to legalize abortions nationwide. I'm Byron York from The Byron York Show. Download and subscribe to my daily podcast to hear all the news of the day. Subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts.